Letter 41. May 30, 1977. Carlsbad, California. K. I agree. I cannot go on without you much longer. But it is not going to be simple. If we are serious, we need to make plans for a lasting future. We have families to consider. We have lives. There is still so much to reconcile. So, yes, my love, I will get away. My kids are spending the weekend of the 4th of July with my parents in Catalina this year. I will tell David that I'm going to my cousins in Anaheim. But instead we can meet, either at the Dell or maybe that place in Newport Beach that you mentioned. And we can talk about what this would mean for our lives and how we can finally be together once and for all. Love. J. Letter 42. June 22, 1977. Carlsbad, California. Carrie. I don't know what we are doing. I ask myself that on a daily basis. At this point, I think we've probably lost our minds a little bit. Mine certainly seems long gone. Should we try to stop them? Is now when we confront them about all this? I worry it will only push them closer to one another. Trying to keep them apart may just be what solidifies them together. I'm not sure what to do. But I can tell you that I don't want to spend the 4th of July alone in my house, with my kids in Catalina and my wife with your husband. It sounds terrible. And I won't do it. I think I'll spend it at our spot. Any chance you know of someone who could offer good company? All yours. David. Letter 43. June 25, 1977. Encino, California. David. I'm going to call the inn and take care of the rooms. You can get us some sparklers and maybe some tiny flags or something. We will be as festive as possible this coming weekend. And we can both try our damnedest to not think too much about what awaits us. Sound good? All my love. Carrie. Letter 44. June 29, 1977. Carlsbad, California. Carrie. Sparkler secured. I will see you Saturday. Here's to making the best of things. All yours. David. Letter 45. July 5, 1977. San Clemente, California. Carrie. I am currently at a gas station in San Clemente on my way home, and I saw this postcard with a sandbar on it and had to send it to you. I left you just a moment ago, and yet I still miss the sound of your voice, the way you smell like coconuts. I can't believe you didn't know you smell like coconuts. It breaks my heart that no one had been smelling your hair. You are a revelation. And beside you, I could feel nothing but peace. Anyway, about the sandbar. It reminded me of you because you are my sandbar. I was lost at sea, and then you showed up. My dry land. Love. David. Letter 46. July 7, 1977. Encino, California. David. Your postcard made me smile. I still blush at the thought of your hands in my hair. I had no idea when we made the plans for the fourth that I would be sad to see the weekend end. I thought for sure the two of us would be holed up there trying to cheer each other up and finding it impossible. But that wasn't it at all, was it? Somehow, as absurd as it is, we found ways to be truly joyful, didn't we? There were moments, I swear, you made me forget why we were even there. Thank you for helping me remember how to be happy. Love. Carrie. Letter 47. July 12, 1977. Carlsbad, California. Carrie. It is I who should be thanking you. You have reminded me that no matter what happens with my marriage, all is not lost. There is still beauty out there still unexpected wonders. The only silver lining, should all this end in disaster, is that there is you. Love. David. Letter 48. July 19, 1977. 
Encino, California. David. You are the biggest surprise of my adult life. I had absolutely no idea when I wrote to you that first time that I was reaching out to a kindred spirit. And as complicated and unforeseen as this all has been, I don't regret a single second of it. How are things there? I have to ask, since coming home, have you found any other letters from Ken? Heard anything else from Janet? Ken has been oddly attentive as of late. He has come home directly after work. He has bought me flowers. Tonight he is taking me out to dinner at the Chateau Marmont, a fancy hotel for movie stars and rock bands. I do not know what it all means. Love. Carrie. Letter 49. July 25, 1977. Carlsbad, California. Carrie. I have found no letters lately, and Janet has stopped excusing herself after dinner to go for a walk, which I've always assumed she spent at the payphone. I do not know what it means. How are you? I hope your cold is better. I'm thinking of you and sending you thoughts of matzo ball soup with extra noodles. Love. David. Letter 50. July 29, 1977. Encino, California. David. I miss you. I hope that is all right to say. I wish, so often, you were here in person. Yesterday, Ken told me that he is going to Palm Springs for a consult on a former colleague's case. He says he'll be there from August 8 through 13. I am assuming that this is a lie, but I have found no more letters from Janet, so I cannot be sure. Has Janet mentioned anything to you? Has she planned time away? If they are going away together again, shall we meet? Love. Carrie. Letter 51. August 3, 1977. Carlsbad, California. Carrie. I've heard nothing from Janet about this. I have no idea. I'll check to see if there are any letters in the cookbooks or glove compartments, or buried in the closet when I get home. If she does go, I'll call you and set a time for us to meet. Love. David. Letter 52. August 6, 1977. Encino, California. David. Ken leaves Monday for Palm Springs. Still no word from Janet? Last night, Ken made me dinner. He went to the store after work and bought groceries. He grilled us steaks and made a salad, including homemade dressing that was from a recipe from a nurse at work. He lit candles and opened a bottle of wine. I was confused and skeptical. But I was also surprised at just how pleasant it was to have his attention again. It had been gone so long, I had forgotten how it felt. He started talking about when we met. He said he spoke to his father after our first date and told him he would marry me. He told me his father told him to choose a woman he could love for fifty years. And then Ken said to me, and that's what you are. I said, are you sure you won't ever want someone else? And Ken said, I will never love anyone the way I love you. Never. Obviously, a large part of me felt like he was lying. But there was another part of me that felt like, what if he has decided once again that I'm the one? But I asked him if he really needed to go to Palm Springs on Monday, and he insisted he had to. So Janet must be meeting him there, right? Love. Carrie. Letter 53. August 9, 1977. Carlsbad, California. Carrie. It's now Tuesday, August 9th and Janet is still here. She seems to have no plans to leave. If Ken has left, I can say definitively he is not with Janet. Do you think their relationship is over? I can't make heads or tails of all this. Love. David. Letter 54. August 15, 1977. Encino, California. David. On Monday morning, just as Ken was getting ready to get in the car for the drive to Palm Springs, he looked at me and said, Why don't you come with me? I said, With you? 
and he said, yes, come with me. And I found myself, packing up a couple of things, and getting into the car with him. It turns out there truly was a consult. It wasn't a lie. How odd to feel confused that your husband is telling the truth. And yet, I have to admit, there was real comfort in that. It was as if the can I fell in love with reappeared, trustworthy, dependable. I spent my days walking around the town and shopping, and then, during the evenings, Ken and I would go out to restaurants and have drinks at bars and order room service for dessert. I swear, when he looked into my eyes, it truly seemed like he loved me. It felt like a new beginning, I suppose. It was as if the past had never transpired. He said he wants to take me on a vacation to Italy next year. He called it a second honeymoon. I'm not quite sure how I feel about it all right now. I'm a bit stunned, to be frank. Is it possible that after all we have both been through, it has ended with them coming back to us? All my best. Carrie. Letter 55. August 20th, 1977. Carlsbad, California. Carrie. Last night, Janet and I put the kids to sleep and then decided to watch some TV in the living room. I was sitting in my recliner, Janet on the sofa, when she walked up to the TV and turned it off. She said, I've been sleeping with someone else. And she confessed everything. She started at the very beginning, how they met years ago, and she thought nothing of it but then ran into him for the second time last August. I didn't realize it, but the night they met again was a night in which she and I had gotten into an argument about how I was always grading papers on evenings we were supposed to spend together. She'd decided, rather angrily, to go out with her friend Sharon. Apparently, she didn't come home until the next morning, and she said I'd barely even noticed. It strikes me as almost unbelievable how little attention I paid to her back then. Not that I'm blaming myself. After knowing the full details, my anger at Janet has somehow become stronger but also more tolerable. That doesn't make much sense, I guess. Anyway, she admitted how long they went on like that, how often they met up, what she was feeling, why she did it. And when she confessed, so did I. I told her I had known for some time. I told her that you and I had been exchanging letters and had become close during this bizarre time. I shared some of our letters as well. There was no confession left to be made by the end of the night. Or I should say we hours of the morning. Janet and Ken are through. And there are no more lies living in our marriage anymore. Janet told me this morning that she wants to stay together, and she asked me point blank if I thought that she and I could get past this. It was a difficult question to answer. I kept thinking of you, to be honest. What you have shown me, how much I look forward to seeing you. You have come to mean so much to me. But if I ask myself whether I believe I can one day forgive the mother of my children and begin to trust her again, the answer that I keep coming to is yes. I believe that I can. And if I find that I can't, I still have to try. I want nothing as much as I want to live in the same home as my sons, to see them every morning, to say good night to them every night as they grow into men. I want the future I had hoped for. I told Janet that I am not quite ready to forgive her, but I do feel ready to work to get there. And that, right now, is enough of a start for both of us. We believe we can put this thing back together. As for the details of the end of their relationship and the trip over the fourth, Janet has told me the full story. And then she showed me Ken's last letters. From what Janet says, she and Ken spent the 4th of July in Newport Beach. They made plans to contact divorce attorneys and made some decisions about where they would live and what kind of custody she would request of the boys. It was all but settled. As they were getting ready to leave, Ken went to pay the bill, and Janet went over to the convenience store next to the hotel and grabbed a drink and a sandwich for the ride home. When she paid, she realized she was a penny short and so she grabbed one from the Leave a penny, take a penny, tray. She said it was brand new, not a scratch on it. It was bright and shiny, exactly the kind I've always loved. And as she held the penny in her hand, 
she realized she couldn't remember the last time she'd seen me pick one up. She couldn't remember the last time either of us had taken a second of joy for ourselves. Janet says that is when she realized that our broken marriage had hurt both of us. That I must be hurting, too. She says she understood, in that moment, that what she wanted more than anything wasn't a life with a new man but our life back. As she said this to me, she said, I could never get back what we had by marrying him. I can only get that back by staying with you. When your husband came to find her, she told him it was over. Apparently, they fought pretty loudly in the parking lot. But there was no changing Janet's mind. She says she drove home and never looked back. As for Ken's letters, this is where I find myself at a crossroads. Are you sure you want to know everything? Janet did not want me to send these, but I told her that I have this last remaining loyalty to you, and she understands. And so, I have included them here. All I ask is this. Please do not read them if you are happy, Carrie. I know that is quite a lot to ask of a person, but I know you have the strength to hold back and protect yourself. You have been doing that for all these months. Protect your happiness at all costs. If he is what you want, put these pages down and choose to be happy. And if he is not what you want, maybe you should leave him without even reading them. I know that's quite some advice coming from me, but I know you, Carrie and Alsop. I know your heart. You underestimate your strength. You always have. You have changed me for the rest of my life, and if I had to go through all this, I'm lucky to have gone through it with you. You will be in my heart forever. Take care of yourself. You deserve only the best. All my love. David Letter 56 July 6, 1977 Los Angeles, California My sweet Janet You cannot possibly mean the things that you say. We are not over. We could never be over. We are meant to be. You are just scared because this is all becoming so real, but it is real, my love. Leave him. I will leave Carrie in a heartbeat. She is not you, has not meant to me in ten years what you have come to mean to me in a matter of months. Just write me back, answer my calls, and we can start our lives together. Love. Your Ken. Letter 57. July 13, 1977. Encino, California. Janet. Please reconsider. Please. I know you told me to go back to my wife, but all I can see when I look at her is my dissatisfaction. You are the only one for me. I can get away on August 8th. I have a consult in Palm Springs. Meet me there, please. Tell me you will meet me there. Give us one last chance together. Love. Your Ken. Letter 58. August 10, 1977. Palm Springs, California. Janet. I brought Carrie with me here to Palm Springs after you spurned me. I think I was hoping we'd have a lovely time together and I'd send you a gloating postcard about how much better off I am without you. But. I cannot do it. Even now, when I am trying, Carrie is not half the woman you are. Janet, you have destroyed me. I wanted you to bear my children. I saw the family we could make. I believed I could have a life with you that I cannot have with Carrie. Look, I know that there were some things I said that were inappropriate. I was upset when you broke things off. I said things I didn't mean. I admit that it is true that there were women before you and if you and I truly are over, then I have no reason to become monogamous. As I've told you, I find it incongruous with our innate human nature. But, Janet, don't you understand? That just speaks to how much I love you, how serious I have been about you. I was willing to give that all up for you, for you, and only you. That is how much I love you, how rare of a woman I believe you to be. It is not easy to let you go. But I understand that you have made your decision, and it is one I have to live with. If ever you change your mind, my sweet Janet, please write to me. 
I am forever yours. Love. Ken. Letter 59. September 16, 1977. Encino, California. Dear Mr. Rosenthal. As discussed in our meeting last Tuesday, enclosed, please find all the letters I have in my possession that were exchanged between my husband, Dr. Kenneth Alsip, and Mrs. Janet Mayer over the last year. My hope is that this serves as sufficient evidence of the affair. I think the plan should be just as you said. We should aim to take him for all that he is worth. Sincerely. Carrie Alsup. Letter 60. April 30, 1978. Boston, Massachusetts. Dear David. Thank you for sending me Ken's letters last year. I am sorry that I never responded to you. I wasn't ready until now. I am writing to you from the apartment over the garage of my parents' house. I suppose I should start at the beginning. After reading your letter, as well as Ken's letters, I spent two weeks going along with all his romantic overtures. I cannot say for certain why I did this. The truth was that I knew I had to leave him the moment I read his letters. But I suppose it has taken me too long in my life to find my courage. And apparently I needed an extra two weeks to summon its full passion. We were out to dinner at an Italian restaurant when I suddenly couldn't bear it any longer. He was in the middle of ordering minestrone soup, and I simply said, I'm leaving you. And then I threw my napkin onto the table, took the keys out of his jacket pocket, and walked out. I made him walk home. I could no longer live in a marriage of such disrespect. That is what it had always been, I realized. Even when I thought he was faithful. And I could not for one more second continue my life in such a manner. For many reasons. But the most pressing of which was that I found out I had someone else's future to consider. Early last September, I realized I was two months pregnant. You can imagine my surprise. But you can probably also imagine my glee. And so I contacted a divorce attorney, packed my things, and within a month, I had moved back in with my parents in Massachusetts. It brings me pride to tell you that I left that asshole. And it gives me sheer joy to tell you that, last month, I gave birth to a beautiful daughter I named Margaret. I am a divorcee and a single mother, and I live with my parents at the age of 31. All things I never imagined for myself. But I'm doing all right with all of it, I have to say. I have my maiden name back, and I'm in a city I love, with my family I have missed and my old friends. I'm about to get my real estate license. I listen to Joni Mitchell whenever I want. Right now, the trees are starting to bloom again. Maggie just learned how to smile. And she feels like a great victory. Frankly, the past year or so has felt like a number of victories, even though it started out feeling like such a loss. But getting to know you, being with you, was the beginning of me understanding just how lost I was in my own life. I needed so badly to see that regardless of whether I could carry a child, I was still me, still worth something. And no matter what my husband thought of me, I was still important. And while my mother often reminds me that I should have been able to see that myself, I am so thankful that you helped me get there. You gave me hope and perspective and confidence. Right before you gave me my baby. We are safe and secure here. I have the money from the divorce, and my mother and father have taken to being grandparents like nothing ever before. We do not need anything from you. I want only for you to know that we are here in Boston should you ever want to find us. Margaret and I are two little peas in a pod. I will take care of her with all my heart until my dying breath. She is in the very best hands. She will be loved from here to eternity. I love her simply for existing. And I love her because she has been my liberation. My life may not be perfect, but at least I can finally say it belongs to me. Thank you, David for everything. We love you. Love. Carrie and Margaret Leah Hennessy.
That's the end of the book. Thank you all for listening to this audiobook.